Oh, that wonderful cross. Oh, that wonderful cross. Uh, the cross is, is, is what we're here to celebrate, but more. The fact that he didn't stay in the tomb, did he? He arose, right? He arose on the third day. So we're here to exalt his name together. And uh, in Psalm chapter 145, it reads, I exalt you, my God, the King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise your name every day. I will honor your name forever and ever. see any visitors, but I want to remind you of our multitasking card uh, is there in front of you. If you have a prayer request, you can put it at the bottom. If the Lord speaks to you in some way, you don't drop it like I did. 
Anyway, if the Lord speaks to you through the, the message or through the, the song service, and you've got something you want to share with us, uh, then you can write that on that too and put it in the offering plate uh, as you leave, and we'll get back with you. Today begins our yearly emphasis on um, Mal uh, Myers, My Myers Mallory State Mission. I have to stop and say that because I, I said the one down in Florida for so long that it kind of comes out sometimes. But uh, in Alabama, we have the Myers Mallory State Mission offering. Our goal this year is $800. And uh, there are some envelopes in the back in the fall for you. And so you can get one of those as you leave. And uh, whatever God lays on your heart uh, for that offering, we would appreciate you doing that. Another thing that I want to remind you of is our one day only winter clothing drive. One day only winter clothing drive. And that's on Monday, September 14th. Monday, September 14th from 9 uh, to noon. From 9 to noon. And again, kind of like the, we did with the food drive, all you have to do is kind of pull up under the driveway back here and somebody will come out and, and pick up the clothes that you have and uh, you can drive on off. All right, minimum contact as far as that's concerned. Now, if you want to come in for a cup of coffee, you know, that's up to you. Anyway, um, so that's our, our one day only winter clothes drive, Monday, September 14th. Also, I want to remind you about Operation Christmas Child. Uh, I've made a, sl a slide that uh, kind of scrolls through our announcements, but it's also somewhere coming up right now. <laughs> uh, but those are some, uh, some items that we need uh, um, more than anything else, all right? Uh, and of course, these are things, toothbrushes, we don't think too much about them because we've got a thousand of them laying around. We've got some that vibrate, some that uh, pulse, and some that you know, do all those things. But uh, some of those kids over there, they have nothing as far as to, for hygiene to clean their teeth with. And so toothbrushes, hairs, comb, washcloths, those kind of things uh, are important to them. Uh, bar soap. Um, you know, not liquid. We don't. We can't do anything liquid. All right. So even toothpaste is out. Uh, but uh, but all of those kind of things. Uh, please, if you're um, if you're able to provide some of those things for us, uh, then we will appreciate it. Um, the prayer list is on, in the back, and so if you haven't got one of those prayer uh, already, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna add one when we get to our prayer time. But um, we, ha we have the prayer list back there for you. Uh, also, the offering plates, if you want to give your, uh, your offering, there are offering envelopes uh, in the pews, and you can put those in the back as you leave. Our scriptures, uh, there are in your bulletin day, but uh, that's Psalm 119.89. And I want to remind you that if you did pick up one of the, the little bulletins in the back, on the back of it is a place where you can take notes. And I encourage you to do that because... Uh, hearing is, is one way we learn, but also hearing and writing down is two better ways uh, to remember what, uh, what the service was all about. And so we've, uh, we've tried to do that for you uh, there. But it's just so good to have you all here uh, with us this morning. Uh, we're going to do something we haven't done, well, we haven't done since I've been here, and that's a quartet that... Um, we've just kind of put together <laughs> and uh, I really uh, thank these folks for uh, for coming and singing with us and we're going to sing a song some of you may know it it's called do you know my Jesus uh, I don't know if you remember that but some of you will remember that and pray for us as we sing Oh, 
does your light reveal? Who is your call for comfort when not but sorrows you feel? Who knows your disappointments? Each time you cry, who understands your heartaches, who drives the tears from your eyes? Do you know, Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have you heard he loves you and that he will die to the end? And that he will die to the end? song. Uh, I, don't, I really don't know why the Lord brought that to my mind necessarily. It's been a, a few months back I've been thinking about that song and uh, it's one that I was raised on and, and we had quartets sing it sometimes. Sometimes we just had people sing it. Sometimes the congregation sang it and it's just a wonderful song uh, asking, uh, you know, do you know? Do you know? You know, the, the church sometimes is filled with people who do not know. They may know in the head, but they don't know in the heart. And so we need to remind them and be reminded uh, that he loves us no matter what. And he will abide with us until the end, whenever the end may come. Well, it is uh, good to see you here this, uh, this morning. Uh, I want to have, we want to have a time of prayer. Uh, there's a couple of things I want you uh, to write down. Uh, of course, to remember the hurricane victims. Um, they're still recovering and you know sometimes once the media is gone once uh you know the world continues to spin around we tend to forget about hurricane victims and uh, and they're still suffering many many of them have no home have no place they're 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 just they're confused some of them i mean i know that because we went through hurricane charlie and I, that's the way i felt you know everything was gone uh, the, the things that you knew were gone. So we just really need to lift them up in prayer. We also want to remember uh, Miss Lanny Young. Um, now, you, you all that may live over in that area, help me, but I was over there and, on a Thursday, and the night before she had swallowed something, she was internally bleeding. Uh, and so let's remember her. Her name's Lanny Young. She is a member of our church. And uh, I pray that, that's, uh, that she's over that right now, but I'm just not sure. So let's remember her until we find out for sure how she's doing. Um, if you do have any other prayer requests, let us know, and we'll make sure that we get them on the prayer list. But let's bow our heads together as we pray this morning. God, you're a God of hope, and we just ask you to fill us with joy and peace and the hope that you have to give us. Speak to us, Father, and help us recognize your voice. Remind us to turn to you first of every, for every need that we have. Please meet all of our needs, Lord, according to your riches and glory. Help us to see other people the way you see them, Father, even when it's difficult, even when we don't like the things that we see. We need to pray and remember those, uh, those folks that are causing problems. Empower every person across the Pathway community to unite with their brothers and sisters in Christ and to love our families with patience and humility. And finally, Lord, please help us to remember uh, to honor you, to honor your name, and to keep it holy. As it's Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Well, I appreciate... Uh,
Brother Cheryl will be here again for, with us today. And uh, I want to introduce Miss Diane. Okay, I, I failed to do that last week, uh, but uh, they are with us. They're members over at Bethlehem, the close Bethlehem. And uh, so we're just really glad that they're able to come and be with us. So, Brother Rochelle, will you just come and uh, give us the word God has for us? Amen. I'm from the close Bethlehem. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's opposed to the far Bethlehem? The Bethlehem in Israel? Yeah, that's pretty. It's good to be back with you this morning. Again, not under the circumstances with the pastor illness, but uh, I'm glad to see you. Smile like you're glad to be here. <laughs> Let me tell you where I come from in case you, you don't know on this. I believe in the sovereign God of the universe. He brought me here this morning to say what I'm going to say, and he brought you here to hear it. So smile like you're liking it. <laughs> I believe that's true. I, re I really do. And when, anytime we gather around the Word of God, that ought to produce some sort of smile, uh, some sort of positive reaction, and then he convicts us, and then that, that hurts. But that's part of it. But it is good to see you. When I was pastoring, I always kind of dreaded uh, these uh, three-day weekends. Because you never know what's going to happen. When I was uh, a kid growing up here in Alabama, uh, Sunday was the Lord's Day. And that's a biblical title. I had a revelation. John said he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. But now in our society, it's just part of the weekend. That's sort of sad to me. I'm, my, I'm pretty traditional, and uh, I think you still ought to give the Lord his day. Now, we don't observe the Sabbath. That's a Jewish thing. But we do give the Lord his day. And I believe that's important. If you've got a copy of the Word of God and you uh, haven't already done so, open it to Psalm 119. Uh, if you've got an electronic device, you can open that too. I'm amazed at the change I've seen in my life. I was born in 1900 and none of your business. <laughs> no, 47. I'll, I'll have a birthday next week. So I'm getting to be an old codger. Some of you know what that is. I won't point you out. Everybody knows who you are. But that's part of life, isn't it? It really is. But if you open to the Psalm 119, uh, stay there. Now, when we finish with the that first verse, we're going to look at the rest of them in that standard. Psalm 119 is uh, famous for being the longest chapter in the Word of God. 176 verses. It's longer than several other books in the Bible. In just sheer length, number of words. It's structured very interestingly as Jewish Hebrew poetry... It has 22 standards, one for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And if you have a printed copy of the Word of God, it'll have those uh, letters mentioned. And in the original language in Hebrew, each verse under that section of those eight in that standard all started with that letter. It was an acrostic, and no doubt part of that was to help uh, aid in um, memorizing and learning. So it is a wonderful chapter because it majors on the Word of God. There are eight different words that are used to describe uh, the Word of God, the law, the, pro, uh, the, the Torah, uh, the commandments, the precepts, the ordinances, on eight of those. And one of those words occurs in all but about three verses in that whole song. 
So in over 170 verses, there is a synonym for the word of God. Do you suppose the psalmist thought the word of God was important? All right. One of my favorite Old Testament verses, perhaps my very favorite Old Testament verse, Psalm 1, 19, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen, glory, hallelujah. Uh, repeat that with me, will you? It's not hard. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Glory. Last week, I preached on Jesus being the living word of God and God's ultimate expression to us. Today, I'm going to preach on the written word and how important that is. And what a verse this is. Think about it. Forever settled. That describes nothing else I know of. Absolutely nothing. That gives me confidence in the word of God. That builds security into my life knowing the word of God is settled. It's not going to change. You can count on it. You can count on it. People need something today they can count on, don't you imagine? Something we can rely on. I see people all the time. They're seeking something. Don't know what they're seeking, but they're out there seeking. They're searching for peace, for joy, for meaning to life, for contentment. They're seeking reality, which I'm kind of confused. I'm not sure I know what that is anymore. They have all these so-called reality shows on TV, and none of them look real to me. Call me stupid, but that's, that's the way I think. But the, people are searching for something, and they don't know what it is. But I promise them this, God can give it to them. Give it to you. And the Word tells us that. It is forever settled. Man, I love that. I love that. We live in a... Strange age. I look back over my life at all the changes I've seen. Uh, when I was a youngster, elementary school age, knowledge, what man knows, was doubling at about a rate of about uh, every 25 years. That's pretty rapid, isn't it? In Jesus' day, it was doubling about every 2,500 years, so they said. Today, we're told that knowledge is doubling every 13 months. In a recent study, IBM said in the not-too-distant future, uh, with the Internet and all that, and as it continues to grow, uh, knowledge... What man knows was be doubling in about every 12 hours. Isn't that amazing? But if it doubles every minute, it's not going to change the fact that the word of God is forever settled. Absolutely. Hallelujah. You can cling to it. The word points us beyond ourselves, and that's what man needs. Beyond this life, it points to God. It tells us of a salvation that's eternal just like he is because he provides it. How do I know Jesus loved me? How do I know he died for my sin on the cross? How do I know he rose again the third day? How do I know that he'll call any and all who call upon him in faith? He'll save them. He'll be their Lord. How do I know 
He's even real. How do I know he hears my prayers and answers them? Now, uh, we write songs and poetry that has all kinds of things about how we know. But I'm going to tell you how we know because the word of God tells us. The word of God tells us. And that's the only way we know. People say, well, I know because of, of my experience. Well, if you didn't have the word of God to guide you, you wouldn't know what your experience was. It is our guide for our faith and for the practice of that faith. The word of God. Karl Barth was, without question, the greatest theologian of the 20th century. He Swiss, grew up there, and he came to prominence by denouncing the liberalism of German theology of his day and all those kind of things. He focused on Jesus and commitment and God working in people's life. And so he's, he, he no doubt is the greatest theologian of my lifetime. Maybe someone else come along and supplant him, but as I look back on history, and one thing he said I love is he said, every believer is a theologian, and that's true. We think about God. Well, Dr. Barth was on a, a lecture tour in the United States in the 60s, speaking in seminaries and Bible colleges and as they would often do when they would have a guest, they would allow them to speak, and, and afterward they would have a question and answer session. Now, I never uh, asked questions to any guest lecturers because I didn't want them to know how dumb I was. But that's all right. But Dr. Barth spoke, and uh, the moderator said, all right, we do have time for some questions. Would anyone like to ask Dr. Barth? A question. A young man sitting here popped up immediately. He said, Dr. Barth, you're the, you're the greatest theologian of our lifetime. You've had more great thoughts about God than any man alive on the face of the planet. Could you share with us, sir, what is the greatest thought you ever had? That's a good question, huh? Dr. Barth didn't hesitate. He looked at that young man, and here's what he said. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a Savior. If you don't get anything else out of the sermon today, get this. The Word of God is forever settled. It is forever settled. Let's go on. The Word... Is persistent. Thy faithfulness continues throughout all generations. Thou didst establish the earth, and it stands. They stand this day according to thy ordinances, for all things are thy servants. God doesn't change. He says so in Malachi 3. I'm the Lord thy God. What? I change not. And neither does his word change. It's permanent, and it's permanently the same. He knows everything. Uh, he's omniscient. That's the theological word for that. Knows it all. But he never changes. Simply put, when you study the word of God, you find that the Bible never seeks to try to prove itself. It never seeks to try to prove the existence with God, of, of God, of sin, of man's lostness. It just states how true that really is. His word is what tells us all this. It majors on him and what he's done and what he is doing in our world and then the lives of those who will submit themselves to him. The Bible says he created all things and in him all things hold together. Talked about that a little bit last week. 
And accept it or not, it still does not change. Now, I've heard people say this. Now, now be careful and hear me out. Don't, don't shout amen or anything. I'm embarrassed. I've heard people say, well, the Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. No, a thousand times no. The Bible says it. That settles it. Doesn't matter where you believe it or not. Doesn't change a thing. It's not based on what you can understand or not understand. It's not based on our approval or our belief. It's based on what God has said. And what he has said, listen, he continues to say. What does that mean? If it was sin 2,000 years ago, it's still sin today. If it was right 2,000 years ago, it's still right today. Doesn't change. You can deny it. You can ignore it. You can argue with it. You can try to get rid of it. But there's one thing you can't do. You can never change it. It is permanent. And that's something very important for us. That means we can build our life upon it. Have you done that? Are you doing that? It's the only thing that's forever settled. I promise you, I don't understand it all, but I promise you another thing. I do stand on it all as being the word of God. The world, creation, scientific laws are all a demonstration of the permanence and the persistence of God. Have you ever thought about that? When I was in school, I learned a few things. I didn't learn much. If there wasn't for people like me, there would be no top half of the class. I mean, you got to have a bottom half to have a top half, don't you? But I learned about gravity and a falling body in physics that a falling body will accelerate at 32 feet per second square. The same mass of any substance in a vacuum now, because different different masses of feathers would be different than lead. It'd be a lot better, and air resistance would be different. So in a vacuum, it's all going to be pulled at the same rate. Because God created it that way. It's the same. It never changes. Light travels at 186,000 miles an hour. It's fixed. It's set. It's not going to change. God built those in. And he's built his word in. It's true. It's not going to change. It'll change you if you'll let it. But it's not going to change. Secondly, the word will preserve you. Look at verse 92. If thy word had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. Oh. It protects us. It preserves us. It helps us keep our sanity. It's an anchor for our soul. It's something to hold on to. It's that solid rock in a world of quicksand. This has been sort of a quicksand year, has it not? In many respects, it really has. But God's word will preserve you if you cling to it. Notice something very important there. He said, my delight. My delight. Do you delight in the word of God? Do you delight in the word of God? I want you to think about that a little bit. I read this week that the average Christian in the United States uh, spends more time watching a commercial in a 30-minute TV show per day than they do in the Word of God. No wonder we're in the mess we're in. For a while in my pastorate, I was uh, 
writing a daily devotional, publishing it monthly for the church family. And I would, uh, went to a lot of trouble to write those and get them printed up and, and put out, and I would leave them and uh, say, if you'd like to have one, pick it up. First time I did it, they all went. I don't know how many I published, but they, they all went. Next month, there were one or two left. Well, over a period of a few months, it got to where there were more being left than there were taken, so I quit writing. If people aren't going to delight in it, you can't force them. You can't push them. And listen, you may say you delight in it, but how much time you spend in it is what tells the tale. Any of y'all delight in your grandchildren? Yes, preacher, I delight in them, but I don't ever talk about them. That's not true, is it? No. Anything you delight in, you spend time with it and you talk about it. How we need to delight in the Word of God. Number three. The word has power, verse 93. I will never forget thy precepts, for by them thou hast revived me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently consider thy testimonies. There are three evidences here in this, these verses we read of the word's power. And we need that today. Notice the first thing he said, it has the power to revive. You need reviving this morning. It has the power to give new meaning, new purpose. It has the power to uh, enable us to overcome trials and testing and temptations. It has the power to enable you and I to make correct decisions. But you got to incorporate it into your life for that to happen. Important. It gives us the power for living and living right. Not, not the way I see it, but the way God sees it. Part of our problem today is we want to cling to God, but we want to live life our way rather than his way. And so what does that do? That fragments us and pulls us apart. Number two, it has power to restore. Restore. And in uh, 94 there, you used the phrase, save me. Probably a better translation with that would be, help me. Help me. I don't know about you, but I've, I've prayed that little two-word prayer before. And it's a good prayer. It's a good prayer. I sought thy precept. I sought what you have to say. Picture here is a person who is seeking to please God. Are you? Not restore me so I can do my own thing. Restore me so I can please you, O oh God. So I can live for you. So I can make a difference in my world. After all, that's exactly what we're saved for. That's why he left us here. Number three, it has the power to restrain. The wicked wait for me to destroy me, but I shall diligently consider thy testimony. The persistence of wickedness always has been and always will be. Till the Lord retires Satan to his home on the lake, I mean in the lake, then we won't have to worry about it. But until then, evil is going to be, and wickedness is going to be persistent all around us. We have to deal with it. We have to face it. 
but we're to do it patiently by considering, and that, that's a strong word. That doesn't mean just thinking about it a little bit. That means really giving due diligence to it, the word of God, the word of God. We don't give up. We don't give in. When things get tough, what? We cling to the word of God. And it makes a difference. It's our defense. When Jesus was tempted by Satan out there in the wilderness, remember the outset of his ministry, he went out there and he fasted 40 days. And Satan came to him at the end of that 40 days and tempted him with three different temptations. Actually, it was one temptation. It was to be the kind of Messiah Satan wanted him to be, not what God wanted. How did Jesus overcome those temptations? He overcame them with three verses from the book of Deuteronomy. I heard Dr. Vance Hamner say one time, if Jesus could defeat Satan with three verses from Deuteronomy, we ought to be able to do it with the whole Bible. I think there's a lot of truth in that. What do you think? Absolutely. Cling to the word of God. You want to restrain evil in your life? Build the word of God into it. And it will surprise you what it will do. And fourthly, the word is broad. Look at 96. I have seen a limit to all perfection. Thy commandment is exceedingly broad. I like that verse a whole lot too. Bible in narrow is broad. Can you hear me? It's broad. A lot of people think it's extremely narrow. No, it's broad. It covers everything. How broad can you get? It gives the total picture. Not only does it tell us what man sees, but it tells us what God sees. Hallelujah. What's narrow is our understanding. Man's understanding. We leave God out. That's why we come up with theories like evolution, Big Bang. They're theories, which means what? They have never been proven. They've never been proven. People come up with all kinds of neat theories that leave God out. I've always been amazed at the Big Bang. You know, there was this, uh, billions of years ago, there was all this glassy stuff out there in the universe, and it bumped together, and there was this big explosion, and out of that came all the planets and stars and all that kind of stuff. You believe that? I got a bridge, I'll say. That's like telling me that uh, two semis ran together here, old Ross Clark, and out of that collision came 50 Corvettes. Doesn't happen that way. Doesn't happen that way. God did it all. The word is broad. It always includes God and what he's doing. So it alone gives hope. Without God, there's no hope. Gives the broad view of life. I like that. Thy commandment is exceedingly broad. Would you like to hear my paraphrase of that? Well, you're going to hear it anyway if you got your ears open, but I'm going to tell you. Your word covers it all. That's what he's saying. Your word covers it all. Glory. Hallelujah. So I'll stop right where I started. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Yeah. 
is it settled in your life? The starting point is salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only thing the word says to you if you don't know Jesus is come and be saved. Come and be saved. There's never been a time you repented of your sins and in faith turned to Jesus and asked him to come into your life and save you. If not, then according to the word of God, not according to me, according to the word of God, you're lost. And the Bible says nothing to you except come to Jesus. Be saved. Are you? Are you certain? If you're going to say you are, then here's my question for you. How much time are you spending every day in the Word of God? How much time do you spend on a daily basis in the Word of God? In this crazy day in which we find ourselves, we ought to be spending more and more. So I'm going to ask you to do that today. I'm going to ask you to commit yourself this morning to spend more time in the Word of God every day. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Understand... It will bless your life. Understand, it'll make you wiser. It'll make you a stronger Christian. But remember, the starting point is with Jesus. The finishing point is with Jesus. And what guides us along the way is the word of God. Dear church, let it loose in your life today and every day. Let's pray about it. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we could assemble ourselves here today and uh, rally around the word. Thank you that it is a settled word. It's certain. It's sure. You change not, your word changes not. Help us spend more time in it every day. Help us understand we need to do that. It is the greatest need maybe many of us even have. If someone here doesn't know you, Lord, and save you, the Lord will pray today be the day they turn to you in repentance and invite you in. And thank you again for the blessed privilege of being here this day and worshiping together around the word of God is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Let's stand together. And as we stand together, turn to someone that you uh, can't see <laughs> and say, it's good to see you again. And then you can leave. <laughs>